Outdoor Hotline is made possible in part by the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, AEGN's partner in conservation. Good evening and welcome to Outdoor Hotline. I'm Tony Brooks. Over the next half hour, next hour, we invite you to call in with your questions about hunting and fishing regulations and hunting and fishing programs here in Arkansas. Our number to call is 1-800-662-2386 or you can email your question at outdoors at aetn.org. Tonight we'll be addressing three topics, changes to the water management plans for green tree reservoirs on the Game and Fish Commission's wildlife management areas, the Game and Fish Commission's private lands program and quail restoration efforts, and the Fisheries Habitat Management Program here in Arkansas. Let's begin with a look at efforts by the Game and Fish Commission to restore fish habitat in Greer's Ferry Lake. The Greer's Ferry Lake Choctaw Habitat Project was really a result of our new uh, uh, strategic plan in the fisheries division, which called for two major fish habitat projects every year. And the idea was to bring fisheries biologists and te technicians from all around the state together uh, for kind of a team building effort, but at the same time produce some tangible results for our anglers. Uh, Greer's Ferry was chosen as the flagship, guinea pig, whatever you want to call it, for the project. Uh, we had done several projects over the years with Corps of Engineers. We had a lot of material to work with. We had a good area to work out of. And I had planned several projects over the years, so it kind of fell to us to initiate the process. This is the first habitat project of this scale that's ever been done in the state by our fisheries managers, by anybody that I know of. The buoys are going to be set a little shallower. Well, we had uh, biologists and technicians from every district in the state come, and that's from the four corners. It's, it's neat working with a group of people like this. We don't get to work together as a group very often, but when they converged, it all came together just like a big team effort. Everybody knew what they were doing. We made assignments. Uh, they hit the ground running and didn't stop until it was done. What you're going to do is you're going to be in the staging area. Uh, Greer's Ferry is not a real productive body of water. It's an old impoundment. It's uh, 60 years old now. It was built uh, initially 100% for flood control. And power generation was added later. So uh, we have no controls over water fluctuation. You know, it's, it's, uh, it floods some years. We get a good flood year. You get a lot of nutrients washed in. You got to get a lot of nutrients leached from the uh, the adjacent riparian area soils, and also from the decomposition of woody vegetation when it does flood up. But then on a lot of years, like this year, the going into the spring, the lake is seven feet low. It's a pretty much bathtub basin right now, and it's not going to be very productive this year. So uh, what we're trying to do is is just increase some of that, uh, that complex woody habitat to give these fish uh, more, benefic more benefits, uh, more places for uh, forage fish to hang out, and also provides good spawning cover for some of these uh, more littoral zone or shoreline species of fish. We had set a target for 300 large cedar trees, and this is just drawn on some of our past experience with habitat projects. On, how many large trees we could get out in a certain amount of time and we were wanting to get all this done in one week. Fish habitats, it's a lot for the angler, but it's for the fish too. Uh, you've got a lot of reservoirs, all of our reservoirs are aging reservoirs, hadn't been any new reservoirs built in a long time. And over time, you lose a lot of the woody structure, which is very important for the fish uh, due to decomposition under the water. Greer's Ferry is a prime example. You've got a lot of stick ups around the shoreline and stuff, but it's like, does a telephone pole make good habitat? They've lost a lot of the lateral branchings, they've lost, uh, lost a lot of the complexity to the habitat that's there. And so by putting in the uh, brush attractors, be it uh, cedar trees or hardwoods, 
or even some of the commercially made or other artificial habitats that are available with a lot of lateral blanching, branching, that complexity gives the fish a lot more habitat to work to. Uh, kind of the base of it, it starts collecting biofilm or paraphyte and the small algaes that uh, is a base of the aquatic food chain. Uh, that attracts your small fish, your bait fish, and in turn your bait fish will attract your uh, larger predator fish. Uh, some fish are, will use it as cover and lay around it. Others will run the periphery of it, uh, feeding on the outside edges and stuff. And in the past, we have marked them with signs on the banks, but those signs have a tendency to disappear real quick. But one thing that we do when we do any habitat project on any of our waters, game and fish lakes, we mark the uh, GPS coordinates and then we have these placed on our interactive map on the Game of Fish website. And you can zoom in till you come to the lake of your choice, like Greer's Ferry, and then you'll see little blue fish icons pop up. And if you go to these icons, you can get the GPS coordinates, and these can be downloaded and put in your handheld unit or your boat sonar unit, and it can put you right on them. Oh, I was very well pleased, and I think everyone else was too. We were surprised at how fast it went, the actual deployment went. We had no accidents, no injuries, no equipment malfunctions, and no equipment damage. So to me, that's a very, very positive thing. Thank you. And you can call in your questions. The number is 1-800-662-2386, or you can email your question at outdoors at aetn.org. Joining us now to answer your questions about the Fisheries Habitat Management Program are Ben Batten and Jason Olive, who are the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's Assistant Chiefs of Fisheries, and Sean Lusk, Assistant District Fisheries Biologist. Gentlemen, thank you for, uh, for being with us tonight. I want to take off on a little bit of what they talked about in that video. When, when you talk about habitat in rivers and lakes, what exactly are you talking about and what, is it, what does it mean? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he hit on in, in the video that, uh, you know, a lot of our lakes and rivers were impounded 50, 60, 70 years ago. And a lot of that good quality habitat, like, you know, freshly inundated trees and, and grass and things are long gone. And so uh, if you go dive in one of our lakes, like a Greer's Ferry or Wachita or any of your big lakes, they're pretty barren on the bottom. And so they, they really need some cover for the fish to hide under. Okay. When you, when you talk about the general state of aquatic habitat in our lakes, I'm sure that every lake is different. That's correct. Uh, there, <clears throat> it's especially in a state as diverse as Arkansas, there's a tremendous variation from, from lake to lake. But, you know, a lot of our lakes that, that get a lot of attention are the large Corps of Engineers lakes, the Beaver Lake, Lake Washita, Bull Shoals, Greer's Ferry. Um, those, as Ben talked about and as Tom talked about in the video, those are old lakes. A lot of the cover's decayed, so the habitat in those lakes is generally not great right now, and which is kind of the impetus for our increased focus on this habitat program. We, we saw what they were doing at Greer's Ferry. Are, are they doing similar things or different things at other lakes across the state? Yeah, so in addition to our large-scale all-hands-on-deck habitat projects, there's kind of a logistical nightmare bringing everyone together. So the districts are doing a lot of these smaller scale habitat projects and have been working with the Corps of Engineers and working with local angler groups to go out and do basically what we did on um, Careers Ferry, but on a smaller scale. Over in my part of the state, which is the west central part, we've uh, done a lot of habitat work on Lakes Washita, DeGray, and we're gearing up to do a little bit on Lake Hamilton. Okay, we've got a Facebook question here from Maureen who says, what is the current status of Arkansas's water uh, quality in rivers, lakes, and streams, and we're kind of talking about the same thing, but water quality may be a little different than what we're talking about here. Sure, it's a little different, but it, it is habitat. It does kind of fit, you know. I mean, it's where the habitat really is just where the fish live, and, you know, uh, we talked about the physical part, but there's also the chemical part when, you, you know, they all live under the water, and, and so water quality is an important uh, item, you know, for, for any fish. And, uh, you know, in Arkansas, we're very blessed, very fortunate to have uh, good water quality in general uh, for most of our lakes. Uh, now, uh, you know, it was mentioned in the video, he said he, he made the comment, Greer's Ferry is not a very productive lake. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's this balance between good water quality, high quality, clean water, and then water that produces fish growth, productive water, which, that has nutrients 
and and uh, things like that. That uh, so it's it, there, there's a balance there. So if the water is really clean, that's a great thing. It's really nice for swimming and skiing and everything. But it doesn't tend to grow big fish. Right. But uh, you know, in Arkansas, our biggest water quality issue is sedimentation mm -hmm. and that comes in our streams particularly and then if you look at the upper ends of the reservoirs you have a lot of sediment filling in and the reservoir getting shallower due to the sediments uh, from uh, land use practices around the streams that flow into the reservoirs. I, I guess as lakes are different times change and is it different fisheries management different today than it was 40 or 50 years ago? Yes absolutely Tony uh, you know some of the challenges that we're seeing today that are the hottest button issues are things that, that weren't thought about then. Again, I, I kind of we keep hitting on age of reservoirs. You know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, these reservoirs were teenagers. They were in the prime of their years, you right. know, and, and, and the best they'd ever be. Uh, you know, now again, we're, we're dealing with some of these with, with habitat and things like that. Um, uh, aquatic nuisance species is something that we often have to talk about. We have some things like uh, Asian carp, various types of vegetation and things uh, that were not present in the state there and that now affect what we try to do. Okay, got a question here from Crawford County. Any plans to do habitat work at uh, Lake Fort Smith? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any plan particularly for that lake. Uh, the district that covers that lake is active. They've done a lot of habitat work on beaver uh, and uh, you can tell the caller, I'll be sure to put in a good word that we should consider doing some more work at Fort Smith. Okay, got, got another caller from Crawford County. This is not exactly on topic, but uh, Lake Fort Smith, any plans for a floating boat dock? Ooh, I'm not sure. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, why has, this is from Marion County, uh, why has the Game and Fish not stocked Northern Pike into Bull Shoals? Yeah, uh, Northern Pike are not native to the state of Arkansas, and uh, there's a lot of predators already in Bull Shoals Lake, and again, that's another one's clear, not so productive lake, so we're trying to kind of focus on the target species that are already there and not add any, any extra mouths to feed at this moment in time. All right, I'm getting a lot of good questions. This is from Garland County. Uh, why did the grass on Lake uh, Washita and DeGray die off and will it come back? So that whole thing, it's a very interesting story. So back in around 2007, there was a lot of vegetation in both Lakes Washita and DeGray and it was mainly hydrilla and there's a lot of marina owners around there. And you know, when it comes to aquatic vegetation, as biologists, we love it because if it's good for the fish, it's good for the fishing. But for the marina owners, it wasn't as good because you get a lot of people that are coming out here, they're wanting to swim and they don't like aquatic vegetation touching their feet. So the Corps of Engineers, they experimented with these Pakistani flies, which are just supposed to, they don't um, completely get rid of the vegetation, but it's kind of like mowing the grass. And I don't know of any reported um, cases where they've actually annihilated all the aquatic vegetation but something happened and the vegetation actually disappeared and it's actually starting to come back on Lake Washita and the uh, the northeastern side of the the lake and with this vegetation it's very cyclical just like almost any other biological system known to man it's very cyclical so when you have um, hydrilla and stuff like that it doesn't go away very easily you know it'll come back so the Corps of Engineers biologist that was working with the Pakistani flies, we recently talked to him within the past couple months and he's predicting that it will come back on Lakes Washita and Gray. And we've got a krill survey going on Washita right now and a lot of anglers believe that we're the ones that, you know, applied herbicide and got rid of it. But it would cost a couple million dollars for one application on Washita and DeGray and none of us are going to flip the bill for that and we wouldn't do that in the first place. So okay. Very good. Uh, we're talking here about work that, that you guys are doing, but is there anything that anglers can do to help you in your efforts to, to improve the habitats in these lakes? Um, like I mentioned before, we do a lot of these small scale district level habitat projects. We work with a lot of angler groups and the more people that we can get out there to help us hauling trees out and getting them in the water would be extremely beneficial. Generally when we do this stuff, we get a lot of people that say they'll show up, but when it comes to waking up at you know, four in the morning, getting out there, getting everything ready and showing up at the boat ramp for sunlight, a lot of people tend to stay in bed. Yeah. So. Okay, we need to, need to get them going. Yeah. Uh, this is from Van Buren County. Uh, would Gannon Fish consider a slot limit on the crappie at Greer's Ferry? 
Well, we uh, we sample our crappie uh, on a rotational basis, and uh, certainly if the if the data uh, that we collect indicated that uh, that that was appropriate, uh, we would. Now we we look at several different factors before we decide on something like that, and not, and not a slot limit necessarily. I mean, sometimes there's confusion over a slot limit, a minimum length limit, and minimum length limits what's typically used on crappie, where they have to be over a particular length. Something we would we would consider if the data showed that it was necessary. Uh, we don't have any data up to this point that has shown that that was necessary, but we look at the growth rate. How long does it take them to grow to, say, if you were going to do a 10 inch minimum length limit? How long does it take a crappie to grow to 10 inches? Well, if he's going to, if that crappie has a better chance of dying before reaching 10 inches, of dying of old age uh, or something before he reaches 10 inches, that's not very smart of us to put a 10 inch length limit on there. But if it's a fast growing population, then that's, that's a, a candidate for a, a minimum length limit. And I'm oversimplifying it, but, but essentially there's three or four different things we look at. Uh, the numbers, the, the fishing pressure, and the growth are being three of the main ones. And, and we'll evaluate that in a holistic fashion and, and determine whether or not that's appropriate. Okay. And I'm, I'm certain this would depend on the lake and depend on but uh, age of fish. I mean, they're going to live longer if the conditions are good. But in general, uh, five-pound bass, what, what are we talking about maturity and, and longevity for bass or crappie or catfish? You know, we just did a, a kind of a meta-analysis of our, all of our growth data, our bass growth data for the whole state that's been collected over the last 10 years or so and tried to kind of look at the patterns <coughs> in different lakes and different regions of the state. And in, in most parts of Arkansas, uh, you know, a five-pound bass is probably going to be six, seven years old uh, at least, at, you know, and we're talking the more mountainous areas on the slower end. Right. Now in the Gulf Coastal Plain and, and even kind of the, the southern delta, Lake Chico, places like that, Felsenthal, Millwood, you know, some of those southern areas, we could see five pounders in, easily in five years. Uh, and and those, those lakes, they're farther south, got a longer growing season, and they tend to be more productive. They have more nutrients. And so that, that produces more forage fish like shad, which gives the bass more to eat, so their growth rates are faster. Yeah. Bass fishermen want to catch that, that trophy bass. What would be the ideal ingredients necessary in the lake to produce what we can consider trophy bass? Yeah, Jason uh, started hitting on some. You know, you have the growing length helps. The number of days that the water temperature is above 55 degrees helps, uh, and you have to have the food or re groceries. We might say, you know, if you if you don't have enough to eat, you're never going to grow big. And and then genetics play a factor. We have some lakes that are uh, appropriate that we stock uh, Florida strain largemouth bass, which can grow. Uh, uh, attain larger sizes, uh, but just depends on the on the situation. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put each of you on the spot now. We're talking about different fish, and I, I know you've all got your favorite lakes, as as do fishermen. But uh, where's the best place to catch, say, bass, crappie, or smallmouth in Arkansas? Every every lake is unique, I'm sure. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead. I'll take, uh, I'll say largemouth bass. Uh, right now, I think our lake that's producing large fish most consistently is Lake Atkins. I'll give a side plug for the Arkansas River. I just think it's interesting, challenging, it's very diverse, and gives you a lot of opportunities. Okay. Yeah, I'll take crappie. Uh, lake Conway, Harris Break, Overcup. And those are our bread and butter crappie fisheries. He mentioned Atkins for bass, but Atkins is, is really cycled up on crappie right now too. It's it's great. Blue Mountain, Nimrod, those are all, so central Arkansas is just really fortunate to have a lot of the best crappie lakes in, in the state right now. Okay. And the third fish was catfish? Yeah. Yeah. Um any of our major rivers that, you know, closer to the lower part of the state. Um, Arkansas River will be pretty good. Going out to Mississippi will be good. Um, I caught a 25-pound blue cat below Felsenthal a little less than a year ago, so that's that's a good place to fish also. And, and just not just improving the habitat, but you guys do a lot of work to help anglers. I mean, there's other things that you do to help help fishermen that want to come to Arkansas and enjoy the lakes and streams. Sure, we're, we're one of the few states that has, uh, and I mean, this is for a specific group really, but, but uh, these tournament weigh-in facilities and, and you know we've had bass tournaments, crappie tournaments, we've had walleye tournaments in the past uh, in Arkansas and any of these groups uh, you know can use these facilities to hold their their weigh-ins. Um, 
What else? Well, I mean, we, we do a, a we do a lot of stuff. Our black bass program really does a lot of work with the anglers, providing assistance for tournaments. Mm -hmm. Well, we we appreciate all you do. Thank you all so much. We're going to run out of time. We're going to move up to our next topic. Up next tonight, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission's private lands program and the quail restoration efforts here in Arkansas. Mr. Hughes here has done, uh, he was uh, involved in our Acres for Wildlife program, which is a game and fish commission program that uh, it provides cost share for landowners. It also provides uh, native grass seed and herbicide. Cost share that it does provide is for prescribed burning and some timber stand improvement. On this particular property, we signed up Mr. Hughes for about 40 acres worth of native grass seed and the herbicide to herbicide out the fescue that was in this field you know, before he planted the native grass. My local uh, private lands biologist has been a, has been a big help in um, evaluating the, the property I have, um, looking at the, the grasses and, and wildlife and so forth that's, that's here, um, and then putting a plan together, actually a, a two-year plan for how to um, establish some native grasses, um, some different types of, of food plots, um, to attract uh, the wildlife that, that I'm most interested in. To get the, the native grasses uh, started, we, we, we began with a prescribed burn, and we did that in, in February of the year. And uh, my local uh, private lands biologist was a, was a huge help in that, um, in terms of putting a, a prescribed burn plan together and also providing some additional resources in terms of, of individuals and then also helping with uh, the equipment that was needed um, and just teaching me um, how the prescribed burn should be done. And then in, in terms of just um, the, the seeding process, uh, my biologist was able to, to actually loan me a seed drill and um, I was able to plant um, about 50, a little bit over 50 acres in one day using the seed drill. Um, with uh, using some, uh, some native grass seed that uh, my biologist was able to provide to me. And so it's been an ongoing process. It, it wasn't just one meeting, just a, an initial, um, let's get started, how do I do this type thing, but it's been an ongoing process where he's been out numerous times to evaluate what we've done so far and, and see what adjustments need to be made. And so um, it's gone very well and, and we've got a good stand of grass as a result of that. You know, the, the wildlife love this, this native, these native grasses. Um, you know, I've seen deer, um, they love to, to feed out here in the grass and, and they especially love to bed down. The grass at this point is, is almost head high to, to a human and so the deer uh, love it as, as, as cover. Um, I've seen a lot of turkey that I weren't seeing before. Uh, the turkey actually have been, it's, it's been kind of overwhelming how many turkey I've seen out here. Um, I mean, before I just saw uh, a limited number. So that's been very exciting. Um, I have seen uh, a lot of dove out here as well and, uh, and quail. Um, so it seems like the, the native grasses have really just kind of attracted a variety of wildlife. I would highly recommend a private lands biologist to, to someone else that's interested in, in developing some of their property for, for wildlife. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I really liked about the process was the biologist was, was very interested in, in my goals and what I wanted to see on the property. So it wasn't um, just a matter of what would be best for the Game and Fish Commission, but it was for me, what was, what was I really wanting to achieve on my property? This place we're at now, Foul Play, uh, it was already in WRP. And uh, WRP is a wetland reserve program that has since changed since the last farm bill to the wetland reserve easement. In 2013, they had a, basically a, um, a hay pasture up here that they were cutting for hay. Uh, just to keep it cut. They wasn't getting anything out of it. Uh, so just want to know if there was something they could do for fawning areas, possibly quail, or if a turkey happened to be come through here, you know, what we could do. So uh, we used Partners for Fish and Wildlife to plant native grasses. So we came in, sprayed arsenal on the Bahia grass, and uh, got the site prep done, eradicated the bad stuff. And uh, that fall, we followed it up. We're planting with big blue stem, little blue stem, uh, Coreopsis, Black Eyed Susans, Purple Cone Flowers, more wildlife friendly grass out there, if you will. Summer of 2013, Ronnie called and uh, said, man, I want you to see about getting uh, one of your waterfowl guys or somebody to come down. So Mr. LC, the, the owner of the property, uh, wants to see what he can do to enhance his duck hunting. It was about this time of year, September, uh, latter part of September, they showed up with a, a disc and, and got it back to dirt. So what we did was go from uh, woody debris that had basically little to no duck use days 
uh, to now we've probably got somewhere along the lines of a million duck use days on this property out here. People don't understand this, but it's a lot of programs out there that will help the landowners develop their property for if they want to hunt, bird watch, recreation, ride, whatever round over they look, but there's, there's programs out there. You just have to get with your, somebody like Bubba or Chris with WRP or Jason. You know, we did a lot of the work, um, you know, and we were reimbursed on a lot of the uh, funding of it. And it's like I say, it's just a, it's a great, it's a great deal. And everywhere I have worked, I've managed property for 20 years. Everywhere I worked, the first thing I did was get with the Arkansas Game and Fish. The ducks is just, it's unreal. It's just, um, it just blows your mind when you, what it was and what it is now. 88 to 90 percent of Arkansas is, is privately owned. So if we're going to make a big impact on wildlife resources across the state, it's going to have to be done on private lands. Now to answer your questions about the private lands program as well as the quail restoration efforts here in Arkansas are Chris uh, Kalklazer, Assistant Deputy Director of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, uh, Marcus Asher, Arkansas Game and Fish's uh, Quail Program Coordinator, and Ted Zavishlock, I hope I got that right, Pretty the good. Private Land uh, Program Coordinator of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And let, let's start off, we, we just saw a really good presentation, but overall, what is the, the, the Private Lands Initiative? What, what is it about? Well, the uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission Private Land Section is a uh, group of nine biologists that work primarily on private land. Uh, we have somebody who covers every county in the state. And so what they do is they provide technical assistance to landowners They go out with the landowner and they uh, give them a, a, you know, wildlife advice. The, a lot of times there's programs we can help landowner with and so we try to funnel them to the proper program and so it is a free service that, uh, that your tax dollars pay for. So it's a, it's a really good program. Very good. And we're talking about the quail restoration program. How did that, how did that come about and just kind of give me an overview of it. Well, it come about, uh, let's see, they've had it for several years, but it's um, kind of a, a strength and focus now. Uh, we are looking at trying to combine private land uh, properties with our own public lands that AGFC owns or leases, and also uh, kind of cooperate with some of our partner organizations to get as much quail habitat on the landscape as, as we can. Uh, we have actually seven different landscapes throughout Arkansas that we've deemed to work in. Uh, and, and they may be showing a map here pretty, pretty shortly okay. of those. So, uh, but just trying to get as much habitat as we can because we're very devoid of, of habitat on, in Arkansas for quail. Okay, got a question here from Lono County. The reason for the license change to printer paper, and we, we talked about this before, there's yeah. there been some changes. Can you give me yeah, an overview there, of that? there have been some changes with our license system and, and a lot of it is to, to come, become more mobile friendly so that our users can actually carry a mobile license with them allow a little more flexibility for buying that license um, and then even allow the Game and Fish Commission some, some ease in contacting those landowners for renewals. For example, we'll be able to send automatic renewals. So it'll eventually be a good thing. It's just going to take a little time to adjust to a new system. Okay. And a, a question here. Why do, uh, <coughs> excuse me, why do I have to provide a Social Security number? Yeah. for the new license system. Social security number is required by the federal government and it's more for child support enforcement. Um, so we're requiring that based on that re based on that federal requirement. So for all of our people when they go to set up a profile they'll need to provide one and if they don't have one then they can there's an exempt button that they can hit to to exempt themselves. Okay. Uh, why are the Bob White quail declining here in Arkansas? Uh, overall is because, like I said before, habitat. We just don't have the habitat that we once did back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, you, you see out on the landscape now, most people uh, like to either uh, recreational mow, you know, so the, the vegetation is about this this tall and nothing can really hide in that. Plus, um, species diversity is, is lost when, when that occurs. Uh, you just see mostly monocultures of grass and, and quail need definitely more diverse plants. Forbs, which are broadleaf plants, uh, shrubby, shrubby vegetation as well as, as grass too. So that's, that's the main, main culprit. It, it is the, the increase of predators, is that a factor at all? Uh, predators play a part in that, but overall in the big scheme of things, when you don't have any kind of cover out there, yeah, uh, 
predation probably does occur and maybe even a little bit at increased levels because they just simply can't hide from those. Uh, but if you have the habitat in place, uh, ideal habitat, uh, your, your predator-prey interactions are, are much reduced at that point. Okay. I have a, a question here from Conway County, and uh, this was kind of covered in the in the presentation, but uh, what is game fish doing to, and I, I think this was a catchphrase, bring, bring back the bobwhite. Yes, sir, do, do you want to? Yeah, I, I'll, t I'll take that one. Um, we're doing several things. One, we're trying to increase our efforts on our own public lands, and then also provide some leadership to our other partners out there, both um, federal, state, and nonprofit partners, about things that they can do on their lands. Um, one of the things with our quail focal landscape that we've done is try to focus on those federal lands and private lands in areas that already support bobwhite quail so that we can grow those. So we, there's some good habitat out there and we're going to focus our efforts on improving habitat around some of those areas that are already uh, have quite a few birds. Okay, and, and you touched on that and, and I've got a really good question here. I want to lead into it. Uh, some of the services that you guys provide to private land uh, owners, what kind of services do private land biologists provide for the landowner? Okay, I'll take that one. Uh, you know, our private lands biologists, you know, the, the ultimate thing that they provide is, a, is, of course, you know, our knowledge of wildlife and, and the programs that are available out there. And so it, each uh, visit starts with a site visit to that particular property that that landowner has. And we generally bring, you know, some aerial photos, some maps, that type of stuff. And so when we come out there on the landscape, we look at, you know, w what is missing as far as habitat, what, what's, what's good that the landowner has been doing, where they need to improve. And then we generally will, in, you know, end that visit with some follow-up uh, management plans and then also kind of lead it into maybe a conservation program that will help you know, offset some of the costs to do some of that work uh, and kind of funnel them towards those particular programs because there's lots of programs out there. Okay, this question kind of leads out of that. How much land do I need uh, to get a biologist to visit and how much does it cost? Well, it's free. It, it's, it's free, obviously. I mean, the tax dollars at work there, but uh, you know, as far as, you know, how much acres, you know, really, you know, any size acres, there's something, there's something that you can do. I mean, even if, if it's a five to 10 acre tract of land, it might be next to a WMA or it might be next to a, a bigger property that, that's doing a lot of stuff for quail or other wildlife. So, uh, uh, you know, generally everybody has, has something they can put into it, so to speak. Okay. Uh, and you kind of, you touched on this earlier. If, if you had to point out one thing that many landowners are doing wrong, for the for the bob quite well, what would it be? Absolutely, it's it's mowing. Uh, like I said, just recreational mowing. I know it's fun for people to get on a tractor, but um, that's probably the worst thing that a, um, a landowner could do if, if he wants quail uh, <laughs> is to go through there because not only is he destroying the habitat, but a lot of times he's killing killing quail or the the chicks uh, the chicks or the eggs themselves. How, how do so. people react when you go out and visit them and you say? You're doing absolutely the wrong thing. You need, to, you need to be. And do you tell them what they need to plan or how they need to? Plan? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah. If you look at, you got to tell them though. I mean, yeah. or, or they're just going to keep doing the same same old thing. But you right. put it nicely. So honesty is the best policy. Yes. Yeah. Well, and most people probably just don't know. Yeah. Right. I mean, they just right. they don't know that they're doing something that's going to be detrimental to quail. Right. And, and you assist with other wildlife as well, but is it possible if, if you own land, say you own 100 acres, to manage for quail, but also at the same time manage for deer and turkey? Absolutely. Yeah. Just about anything you do for quail uh, management is going to help deer, turkey, uh, songbirds, butterflies, uh, you name it, basically, because it's creating early successional habitat, which is used by a lot of different, spe lot of different species, basically. So. Okay. Here's a question. Obviously, they've been listening to us. Uh, why do we still have a quail season if the population is so low? <laughs> we we still. I mean, it's it's low, but it's not. I mean, they're not completely rid, ridden of the of the state. Um, so we want to still provide some opportunity uh, for folks. Uh, and and but with that, yes, you may <coughs> you may take some out that could have possibly survived. But overall, uh, if 
you're, you're not going to be hurting the population because it's more or less compensatory right. uh, mortality. Uh, most of them, 20, uh, 20 to 30 percent, are going to die or are going to survive to the next year. So that other 80 percent can theoretically be shot, basically. Okay. So, and, uh, yep. uh, here's it mentions a phrase here. Uh, what is the biggest cost share opportunity for someone in the Ozarks to manage uh, for wildlife? I'll take that one. Uh, generally, you know. Depending on what part of the state you are in, there's obviously different farm bill type programs that are that are more focused to that kind of landscape. And I would say in the Ozarks, it's more the EQIP program, which is Environmental Quality Incentive Program. It's a uh, one of the farm bill type programs, and it, it basically provides cost share for certain quail practices that a landowner wants to do. And also, of course, our, our Acres for Wildlife program, which is a Game and Fish Commission cost share program that we have, that, that one is also big in that part of the state. Okay. This next question sounds like an obvious one, but I couldn't answer it if I had to. <laughs> Why do quail whistle in the spring? Uh, to attract mates, basically. I mean, that's pretty yeah. simple. And kind of to announce to them somewhat that, the, you know, that's kind of their, their territory, basically. I mean, it's kind of a loose territory, but yes. Okay. Those two things. Uh, I, I don't remember if we mentioned it in the piece there, but uh, prescribed burning, how, how does that work? How does prescribed burning work? Yeah. Um, so you want to, with, with anything that you do, you want to have a plan for it. So you don't want to just willy-nilly go strike a match and, and let, it, let it burn, basically. You want to have a plan that has certain weather conditions, certain parameters, basically, uh, in which this fire will not escape. Uh, is, is one of the biggest things uh, so that you don't destroy somebody else's property. Uh, but basically depending on the objective that you have, uh, it, it's going to depend on when you do the prescribed fire. Uh, if you just want to remove leaf litter and, and uh, get more bare ground on the, on the landscape, then it's probably like a spring burn basically. But if you want to remove some woody vegetation, I uh, usually do it in the growing season when things, when trees and, and stuff have the sap up so that you can kill them, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, so, um, but what else? Um, I also say we, we do a series of landowner workshops on burning. Uh, generally, it's around the, the January to March time frame. We'll, this year, we just got done doing four landowner workshops on prescribed burning. So, you know, we, we post that on our website and that kind of stuff. So, that's a good place for our landowner to start to, to, to learn more about how to do it properly. So. Okay. Here's a question from uh, Pike County from Chuck. Uh, are fire ants affecting the quail hatch? I mean, yeah, they, they can get into the, to the chicks once they, once they hatch out, uh, but mostly no, that's not, that's not a big, big issue, not as far as the, the overall declining population. It's a very small, small portion of, of, of an effect on there. Okay. This question from uh, Prairie County, uh, do pesticides hurt quail? They, they can, um, mainly indirectly because they get rid of uh, what's called quote unquote weeds um, is, is what attracts the insects, uh, which is a big food source for quail. Also those, uh, those broadleaf plants that are called weeds are pretty much the, the seed producers, uh, which is what the, the quail feed on. So yeah, indirectly they, they can have an effect, so. Okay, yeah. uh, there's another question from Lono County. Uh, did the drought of 1980 have any adverse effect on quail population? Certainly, any any time there's drought, you obviously don't have uh, as much of those seed producing plants. You don't have the insects probably as well. Uh, so yeah, those those two factors can can play play big on there. So plus also the the amount of water in, in eggs as well can, right. can be a factor as far as hatching and things. So, But the, but the quail is still out there and you encourage especially young people to get out in the woods and, and enjoy. Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. quail have always been kind of boom or bust species. Yep. They, you know, they flourish when times are good and weather events are good and droughts such as what you said, you know, then the population drops down. But they, you know, that, that's just kind of the nature of the biology of the bird, you know. Okay. Thank you all very much. We Thank appreciate you. it. We're out of time for this segment. And finally tonight, we're going to talk about some changes to the uh, water management plans for green tree reservoirs on the Game and Fish Commission wildlife management areas. Let's take a look at that.
natural state is known far and wide for its superb duck hunting, but it's the abundance of flooded green timber hunting that sets Arkansas apart from other popular duck hunting destinations. I've heard people refer to timber hunting in all sorts of different woods that aren't really anything like the true timber hunting in Arkansas. You just don't have these large blocks of public land like we have in Arkansas that are accessible to pretty much anyone. They're just a remarkable resource. It is something completely unique. It's, it's not available on this scale really anywhere else in the world. Arkansas boasted more than 5 million acres of bottomland hardwood forests prior to European settlement. And while maybe 20% of that is all that remains, the natural state is far better off than many of its Mississippi River Delta neighbors. The construction of green tree reservoirs has also helped to preserve the state's green timber hunting legacy. GTRs, as they're commonly known, allow land managers to artificially replicate the seasonal flooding patterns of traditional bottomland hardwood forests. They provide critical habitat for migrating waterfowl and hunting opportunities for the state's duck hunters. Green tree reservoirs are actually a very important part of what's left of the bottomland hardwood forest that was historically widespread in Arkansas all the way across the eastern part of the state. Arkansas is famous for its wealth of public green timber hunting at places such as Biomeda and Black River Wildlife Management Areas. But if the state's reputation as a mecca for green timber duck hunting is going to persist, water management on public green tree reservoirs must change. The artificial flooding regime that has been in place for decades has had negative effects on forest health. The trees that live in those areas are trees that uh, tolerate some flooding during the course of the year, mainly dormant season flooding, but not growing season flooding. Uh, green tree reservoirs, of course, have been managed uh, for waterfowl hunting primarily, at least in recent years. So the timing of the flooding in many cases in the past was geared more towards the timing of duck seasons as opposed to the timing of when the natural flooding would have occurred in those bottomland forests. Over a lot of years, we've learned that what we call dormant season flooding maybe isn't our understanding of that maybe isn't perfect um, and maybe some of the flooding timing has been off quite a bit for, for quite a few years. A growing body of scientific research over the past two decades has taught land managers and wildlife biologists that long-standing artificial flooding practices have caused trees to get sick and in some cases to die. We've also learned that oak species that are most beneficial to ducks and other wildlife are being replaced by more water tolerant species such as green ash, elm, and overcup oak that have far fewer wildlife benefits. There's no red oak regeneration happening within a tenth of an acre. Everything that's in here is elm and overcup, which are more aquatic species. You go out duck hunting and you just think a tree is a tree, uh, maybe we know the difference between cypress and, and some oaks, but within the oak trees, there's huge differences in the value to ducks. And mainly it boils down to the acorn being small enough that a duck can actually get it, get it in its mouth. When artificial flooding comes too early, stays too long, or rises too high, the signs of diminishing forest health slowly appear over time. One of the consequences, uh, certainly unintentional, is that the trees have been exposed to this kind of unnatural way that they have flooded in terms of the timing, the depth, the duration, the same thing year after year. Uh, when the trees get stressed, probably just like if you and I got sick, we start to see symptoms that indicate that the tree is not as healthy as it was. This big nut all oak that's leaning because its root mass is dying. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission will alter water management on its green tree reservoirs to try to mimic what happens naturally. No rocket science here, but rather just trying to emulate or to replicate, if you will, what Mother Nature would have done naturally anyway. First off, make sure that we don't have prolonged flooding in the growing season, either in the fall or in the spring. Secondly, to try and replicate the things that occur across years so that we don't do exactly the same thing year after year because that's not how Mother Nature did it. Today's duck hunters may have to make some short-term sacrifices, but the long-term benefits make it worthwhile. I'm an active duck hunter. Probably a lot of the people that are interested in this are active duck hunters. Uh, everything that we're doing is not in any way to jeopardize that legacy of hunting. And we want to make it better. 
and we want to make it sustainable. And for sure, we want to make sure that we do it in a way that not just you and I can enjoy, but our children, our grandchildren, and for generations to come. That's what we've been entrusted with. We've been fortunate enough to be able to be able to manage these spots, to do it in a way that's sustainable, and that's what we need to be doing going forward. And once again, the number to call with your questions, 1-800-662-2386, or you can email your questions to us at outdoors at AETN.org. Joining us now for your questions, we have Brad Carner, the Chief of Wildlife Management with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And this is Luke Naylor. This is not Alan Jackson. I don't know what that was. Yeah. That's yeah. A Game and Fish Commission Waterfowl Program Coordinator and Martin Blaney, who is a Habitat Program Coordinator with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. Gentlemen, thank you uh, for being with us. I, I want to point out, and I want to ask you what, again to kind of give us an overview of this, but this uh, management plan, this change is taking place on game and fish property. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Our, our uh, wildlife management areas that we own around the state, uh, specific to waterfowl, we have uh, roughly 50,000 acres on 19 different wildlife management areas scattered around the state that we intentionally uh, flood uh, during the winter for waterfowl hunting. And, and, and why are we, just to get to the base of it, why are we changing? What, what's changing yeah. about that plan? Less, more variable water, um, later water in general, and uh, just, just kind of getting back to what just the end of that end of that video right there, just bringing it back to a little bit more what the natural flooding cycle is to the best best of our ability for now. Is this a serious issue? I mean, it, yeah. it, obviously it is. You're taking action on it, but how, how serious is this problem? Yeah, it's a big deal. We've been managing these places for 50 or 60 years. A lot of them uh, managing water pretty much the same way for all those years and starting to see a lot of mortality in, in a lot of valuable red oak species that, that uh, are, should be in these GTRs are starting to be replaced by other more water tolerant species that have a lot less value to, to ducks in particular. So uh, it's, a big, it's a big change that's happened over a long period of time and it's gonna take a fair amount of time to turn it back around, but, but we're starting now. So, so it reached, I guess it's reached a tipping point now where you've, you've got to take some action now to prevent further, even further damage. Yeah, yeah, you've really gotten to a point now where it's, um, damages, it, it varies from GTR to GTR. Some of them are pretty extreme. We've actually had some of these areas that have experienced complete mortality where all, all the trees in these particular, certain GTRs have, have, have died, um, totally changing the habitat type. So. Um, yeah, it varies across the state, but pretty much all of them have some uh, some signs of water damage, water stress, and so we're making changes to all of them. Um, at least initially, now kind of some kind of some wholesale changes with kind of some general just moving flooding dates back. In the future, we're going to get a lot more specific about what we do on each particular GTR. Okay, this is from uh, Yale County. Is uh, game and fish draining wetlands on Pettigene? Draining wetlands on Petty Jean? No. No, no. Martin can talk about okay. that, I think. No, Petty Jean, Petty Bean, Petty Jean's been operated uh, as it's being operated now for, for many years, and uh, there's no drainage uh, 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 project going on. But we have the same problem on uh, the GTRs in, uh, on that area, and that is, uh, you know, they've got a infrastructure and a water control uh, uh, infrastructure that, that uh, allows us to flood those uh, differently than the, the adjacent lands. And through the course of my 30 years, um, forest health has uh, at times been very bad in those, uh, those impoundments. So the change is really needed. Okay. Uh, this is kind of a complicated question. I'm, I'm sure you can answer it. This caller said, I've cleaned a lot of ducks that I've shot on these areas and I haven't found any acorns in their craws. How does this line up with what you're saying about the importance of these areas as food sources for ducks? Yeah, we've, we've done a series of public meetings this year and gotten a lot of questions along those lines. And, and uh, you know, we, we, it's interesting you think I, I duck hunt on these public lands also and not for as many years as some of these folks that, are, that have asked these questions. But, um, you know, it's interesting whether on public or private lands, Ducks use these bottomland hardwood forests for a lot of different reasons. Some of it's just the structure of it. Some of them is just they can get some isolation in there. They get thermal cover. We all go into the woods. You know, the wind dies down a lot. You know, you get a lot of windbreak that way. Uh, but they are in there. They do eat acorns. They are looking for those red oak acorns. 
Uh, and, and it's interesting as these questions have come up that you think about the typical pattern of a duck hunt on a given morning. Uh, most duck hunters uh, don't really, we, we don't allow afternoon hunting on, on WMA, so it's all in the morning. Right. And it's all, typically duck hunters are trying to shoot ducks as they come into that area, right? That That's exactly. what they're doing. They're not typically letting them land, letting them feed for a couple hours, and then going to say, okay, we're going to go over there and go shoot them now, like you might do for a for a uh, food use study, you know, right. if you're a biologist. But so you, you kind of you kind of backtrack that a little bit and think, well, why would I shoot a duck that's coming in to these bottleman hardwoods, and why would I expect to find acorns in its crop? I've shot the duck as it's coming into that habitat, so so it has had no chance to feed. And, and collect and get acorns from that habitat because I shot it as it was coming to it. Right. So it's really, we really shouldn't expect to find much. Now, if we allowed afternoon hunting and people are out there at four or five, five o'clock in the evening, um, and, and yeah, you might expect to find some acorns in them when they fed all day. Okay. Uh, will this new management plan affect crowding on the on the GTRs? You know, it could. I mean, we're, we're we've got a limited amount of acres. Um, it's. You know, there'll be maybe at some times in some places less water than what there is now, but the overall, you know, the overall expanse of what we might flood in any given year is not necessarily going to change. It may be just the timing of that, but the max extent of flooding is not necessarily going to be different. It may just kind of stage up to that a little bit slower, um, similar to what happened this past season. It was a pretty dry duck season, um, and, and that might be a little bit of a, of a inkling of what we might expect under more natural flooding patterns. You know, the important point uh, on that question too is that our, uh, most all of these areas will flood naturally throughout at some point during duck season and so uh, regardless of what changes we might make on the front end, the overall amount of water throughout the, the entire season is, is, should be relatively similar to, to what it has been previously. Right. Okay. Have a caller wants to know why are we cutting timber on some of these uh, areas? Well, uh, <clears throat> forest management is is part of uh, our mission statement when we're talking about the sustainability of this habitat. To just get it for a few years and affect the population that comes here to winter is not is not really what we're after. We're after a sustainable habitat that's uh, that's a quality for the animal, but um, uh, the thing that we're losing in these uh, GTRs, as it was mentioned before, are the, the red oaks are falling out and we're going to a more water tolerant trees. When you switch the species, you know, you're, you're going to switch the whole food chain. But our red oaks um, and oaks period are, are not adapted to growing into the shade, in the shade. Uh, the other species in, in the bottomland hardwood forest, like elm and, and gum, they're, they, they do grow in the shade, so they have an advantage over the oaks. If we don't open up the canopy of some of these uh, uh, forests and let sunlight come down, we'll never propagate another generation of trees. So that's one of our prime missions in, in this era of the Game and Fish Commission is to go through our properties and, and open up the stands of, of timber so that sunlight can propagate another oak forest under this one. Okay. Uh, this caller says, why is there so much debris left on the landscape after a, a timber harvest on a WMA? Well, I didn't say that timber harvest is not, uh, uh, it's not a beautiful thing. Uh, it's a disturbance, uh, but a lot of that coarse woody debris that's left after logging because we're in the bottoms. And these bottoms, for instance, this uh, next weekend, if we get the rains they're uh, forecasting, the entire bottoms will be underwater for a period of time. Uh, so the decaying mechanisms of bottomland hardwoods are much faster. And uh, so that melts down after a few years. But uh, right after a harvest, it, it's, it's not really some great to look at. Okay. Uh, what's gonna happen with mud motors on WMAs? <clears throat> Uh, that's a question that has uh, generated a lot of comments uh, from the public and, and something that our commission has, has taken under consideration. Uh, but at, at this time, we, we do not have any proposals on the table before our commission uh, for them to, to take under consideration more of a kind of further investigation and see what uh, 
might be done to to lessen noise levels of all motors and, and not single out just one. But at this time, there there are no proposals uh, that have been made to the commission to, to change anything regarding uh, surface drive motors or mud motors. Okay, here's a good question for a wildlife biologist: Why can't a duck feed in deep water? <laughs> he just physically can't reach anything on the bottom, so they 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 eat some stuff that's kind of floating around in the water column, you know, some bugs that are maybe swimming around um, that they can uh, forage on those a little bit. But typically ducks are feeding right on the, the substrate, you know, right in the mud layer, the leaf litter in a forest or um, the, the vegetative layer, like on a rice field. I mean, the, the, the thatch layer, if you will, right there, that's kind of, that's where all the goodies are. That's where the seeds fall. That's where most of the invertebrate growth is. Uh, and so they're trying to feed right there on that forest floor. And so they physically can't reach more than about 12 inches underwater when they tip up. We've all seen a duck do that tipping up uh, feeding behavior. Right. And when they do that, if you, you stretch them out as much as you want, and uh, he can't reach more than about 12 inches, and they'd really prefer to feed in about four or five, six inches. Okay. So we've got about less than a minute. Uh, where is the safest place to build a GTR to avoid the types of damage to trees we're talking about here? I, I think uh, I first would say GTRs should have, you should have some assemblage of control over water. Putting it on when you need to and taking it off when you need to. That's the, and so that's higher up in the, in, in the uh, uh, bottoms than right down by the major tributaries. Uh, when these was, were built, they were built uh, 50, 60 years ago and, and we've learned a whole lot since then. But if I was to think about making one, I think I'd go farther up the stream to where I had more control over the water. Okay. I wish we had more time. Some good yeah. questions coming in tonight. Thank you all. That's thank you for being with you. us. And we're out of time. Uh, thanks again to all of our panelists uh, for tonight's uh, program. We appreciate you coming out. And we thank you for your questions. And we'll see you again next time on Outdoor Hotline. Good night. Hotline is made possible in part by the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, AEGN's partner in conservation.